Yeah, thanks. My name is Matus. And uh, the way this talk's going to work, it's two experiments. I'll use the slides for about 20 minutes, and then I'm going to use the board for 30 minutes. I've changed the proportions because I was pretty inspired by Andrea. I thought it was very clean. Uh, so um, I'm going to, if I rush some of the slides, don't worry. It's, I'm just trying to have more time to use the board. And the board will just be for proofs. And um, so I'm, I'm only really going to cover one thing. So that's the middle thing. But it's going to be three applications of the perceptron convergence proof. The first, I'm just going to remind you of uh, what, what the perceptron convergence theorem is and show you some simulations. So the other experiment of this talk is I'm using, as you can see, a Jupyter notebook because I have an interactive simulation. I, I shouldn't mention him too much, but I was also inspired by a talk I saw by Andrea here 11 years ago where he showed a simulation at the beginning of his talk. So, <laughs> so I'm also going to show a simulation. Uh, the second paper is what the majority of, this is what I'm going to prove, and it's also um, the ma majority of what I'm going to tell you about. This is a paper that uh, the primary author was Jing Feng uh, Wu, and, and it was just posted on archive. And this is a, a large step size analysis of um, literature regression. So in particular, just to throw out one punchline or two punchlines about what you can do with this proof, it's an SGD for literature regression. It gets a 1 over t rate. The step size can be arbitrary. Arbitrary. It makes no appearance in the right-hand side of the bound. You can set it to 10 to the 10 to the 10. It cancels. Okay? And for GD, with a constant step size, you can get a rate of 1 over t squared with a constant step size. GD. No momentum. No Nesterov. Uh, so my, my co-authors were inspired by this edge of stability phenomenon, but uh, I just thought it was cool to have GD with a 10 to the 10 to the 10 step size. And then the last thing is what I had originally intended to speak about, but it's not done yet, but I'm going to use a, a different flavor of mirror descent, and I'll just flash the theorem, and then we'll go on. And again, for the people that came in late, don't worry if I skip some of the slides. Basically, my goal is just to show you the simulation theorem statement and then move to the board for the proof. Sorry, uh, I came in late. I should have introduced Matthew. Oh, I already said my name, so it's yeah, well, good. Yeah, so, but you all know him anyway. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, yes. good. Sorry about that. I lost track of time. It's okay. No, I just don't want people to be late to lunch because no. I know that like once 1220 strikes, like. <laughs> okay. So, let me remind you of two ways to look at the perceptron, uh, the definition of the perceptron algorithm. So it's this very clean classical algorithm from 1958, which uh, you just you see a new example and you rotate towards it if you made a mistake on it. Otherwise, you do nothing. And just to be clear, when I say you're rotating towards it, if you just calculate the new step inner product with the example you just saw and you just work it out, you see that you increase this quantity because you have this squared term. So you always increase your inner product with whatever you just made a mistake with. Okay, so one interpretation of the classical algorithm, just a pure intuition, is that it rotates towards correctness. There's a, another way to look at the perceptron algorithm, which I really like to tell people about, is that it's SGD on the ReLU loss, and you intentionally step away from the global optimum. That is what it is doing, okay? So if you write the algorithm down, this is nothing but the subgradient of the ReLU loss, except you must, at the zero, at the non-differentiable at zero, you must use one. So it's a subgradient. It's between zero and one. You can choose anything at zero. If you chose zero, you would just stay at the global optimum of the ReLU loss. You don't, though. You step away. You force yourself to use the unit gradient selection, subgradient selection. So it's this perverse convex opt algorithm where you step away from the optimum and then you come back. Okay. <laughs> this is a fun way to look at the algorithm. And if you, if you watch it run, it actually does what you see in the second one. So if you watch it run, so let me just tell you what I'm drawing here. So uh, let me increase the step size a little bit. 
So I'm showing you a couple quantities. So here's the path. Okay, here's the path. I'm running uh, on some data, Gaussian data actually. I'm running perceptron. And it takes this many steps and it stops. After that point, it's going to be correct on all the data points. And what these contours are, are these are the sublevel sets of the ReLU objective. Okay? And this cone here is the set of points where you classify everything correctly. So it's the zero sublevel set of the ReLU loss. And you start, indeed, at the corner of the, at the point of the cone. You start at zero, you start optimal, you step out, and you keep bouncing until you end up back in there. Okay? And I highlight this because this actually reminded me of the edge of stability phenomenon. Uh, I'm throwing, showing two other quantities here. The sum of the derivatives of the loss, the derivative of the loss is the indicator whether you made a mistake or not. So this is the quantity you control on the left-hand side of the perceptron convergence theorem. And I'm just drawing it. You see, you end up with five mistakes, and you never make another one. And then here's the average of the loss over time. Okay, so if I scroll down a little bit, I've shown the same thing with the logistic loss. And I zoomed in so I don't have the, the slider anymore, but let me just talk it through. So what happens is you change the step size with the logistic loss. You have an erratic phase that looks like what perceptron does, but where perceptron would just stop here, you end up in a region with a very small gradient, and then you just follow this nice trajectory. So logistic loss, logistic regression, it has an unstable phase, and then it enters a stable phase. And, okay, I said there's a motivation for this. The motivation that my co-authors highlighted was that this is the edge of stability phenomenon that people have been popularizing lately, where you have an erratic phase where the loss oscillates, and then you enter a stable phase. Um, so, so these plots exactly capture this. Here, for instance, the average loss, you see it's non-monotone, and then it enters a stable phase. Uh, this is still the sum of those derivatives, because as you can guess, I'm going to analyze logistic in the same way I analyze the perceptron. In this simulation, does it matter whether you have separable data or not? Ah, that is a very good point. Everything in this talk is separable data. Yes, so there exists a hyperplane that strictly separates the data with some positive margin. It matters for everything. Yeah, every bound will depend on one over the margin. And a lot of these phenomena are false in the case that it's not separable. For instance, here, this, so for the perceptron, the number of mistakes you make, the sum of derivatives is a constant. Here, it actually grows like log t. So this one is just one over gamma squared. This one's log t over gamma squared. And if the data is not separable, it becomes root t. You just keep making mistakes. So, yes. You know, and I, I just say that with the validity of the separable assumption keeps flipping. There was a while when everyone was interpolating, and then LLMs came along, and as everybody knows, we do not get zero training error with, with LLMs. We do one pass of SGD with LLMs. So formally, we're not in the separable regime in 2024 anymore. <laughs> But yeah, so the, the, the story is that there's an unstable phase and then a stable phase. And this seems to relate to this edge of stability phenomenon a lot of people like. And mathematically, for me, this is uh, very interesting. And one thing I want to point out is a question actually that Jing Feng, the, the primary author on this paper, was very excited about, is he actually wanted to argue that using an unstable step size is optimal. And that happens in these plots. As I increased the step size, I was actually getting to a lower loss earlier. So large step size kind of jumped out of this unstable phase and then was very far along in the loss contour. So for this Gaussian data, it was actually better to use a large step size. Okay, so, so this is the motivation for the talk. It's both a non-technical motivation of this edge of stability phenomenon and a technical motivation just being able to analyze these two phases and being able to analyze a large step size SGD and GD. Non-descent step size. I mean, when I say large step size, I mean 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10. And the problem is like one smooth, okay? So you violate all the conditions. That's what I mean by large, okay?
And indeed, the entire motivation for using Jupiter was this one figure. So it's all uh, downhill from here. I had a lot of fun making this. <laughs> for people that haven't tried this, I, this is with GitHub Copilot. I mean, so I didn't have to work too much. OK, so here's the, let me just look at the clock and make some decisions. So here's the classical Novikov perceptron convergence theorem. So for any step size and margin gamma, the number of mistakes, which is the sum of these gradient terms, is less than or equal to 1 over gamma squared. And I'll show you how to do this. It's fairly easy. You can push through the same proof almost identically for the logistic loss. The value looks like a logistic, right? Why shouldn't that work? It, it works. Uh, so a few years back, uh, Zoe G and I, we, we, we typed this up. You can find this on archive. And um, if you use, so here we have to have a little bit of a disaster. So here we actually, so this is a descent. This is a descent based guarantee. This gets, uh, this, we need to bound the step size by the smoothness. So this is not doing what I promised yet. Um, so for, 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 for your result, like in, in Perceptron you go, it's sort of an online, right? So you go one sample at a time. It's SGD, but it's like with batch size one. Yes, this, this is in the online setting. There's also like one sample. Like yes, I sh so I should make a comment. This is a question you can ask me as many times as you want because there's something very pretty that you can do here. So, okay, this is an online setting. We just have to have a sequence of data points that satisfy the margin condition. And it's not in the slides, so I should at least put it up once. So in other words, all the data points I see, they have to lie either here or over here. This distance is gamma. And so I'm requiring that the infimum, I'm requiring that there exists a u bar exists a gamma norm of u bar is equal to one. Gamma is greater than zero. And if I look at all the examples, this is greater than gamma. Okay. So that's the, that's the margin assumption. Um, so this, so I just require the data to satisfy this. It can be online, whatever. I'll just mention one thing, because I was calling it SGD stochastic. If it actually is random data, even with the unbounded step size, it's not in this theorem, but it's in a couple slides, you still get, you get log t plus log 1 over delta. Why? Because you hit this with the martingale. The martingale is on a bounded quantity. This is a derivative logistic loss. It's a bounded quantity. You martingale this thing. So the right-hand side ends up looking like log t plus log 1 over delta divided by t gamma squared. So you get a 1 over t rate, unbounded step size, log 1 over delta, high probability, SGD. It's a good question. So again, I'm always going to show you the, in, in, when I use the board, I'm also going to show you the online guarantee, but you martingale this thing, and this is a bounded quantity, and that's how the step size doesn't kill you. Okay, so, it's, so this is, you get almost the same guarantee, and I'll, sh I'll show you how. And, um, okay. This, this is just, okay. So now let me tell you about the, the new paper, and I'm going to tell you, uh, four things that are in the paper. And like I said, I'm going to stop myself so that I have enough time for board work. So there's, in this paper, there's an SGD guarantee where the rate we get is 1 over t. There's a GD guarantee where the rate we get is 1 over eta times t. Eta is the step size. So if you decide in advance to set eta to t, then you get a 1 over t squared rate. By the way, I enjoy this because if you open a convex op book, it says, no, 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 no. Set your step size to 1 over root t or something like that. I'm like, no, no, set it to root t. Just flip it. It's better. Uh, then this is using the logistic loss. I'll discuss other classification losses, things that ask them to 0, not regression losses. And then for me, mostly to demonstrate the power of the proof technique, it does handle the NTK just fine. But th this is a little perverse, and I'll, I'll mention that. So. so just going back to what you just said, like, as long as the loss has a derivative that's bounded, you can hit it with this smarting little thing and get that result. Okay, yeah. so there's a, lot, there's a lot to say here. So, okay, it is true that the quantity in the left-hand side of the bound is the derivative of the loss. And it, there is a, so we do require the loss to be Lipschitz or its derivative to be bounded. We do require it in the proofs. 
But in order for these sorts of rays to go through, we need other conditions in the loss too. And I actually do have the conditions in the slides. So does that answer your question? Yeah. I, I mean, boundedness is used in more than, of the derivative is used in more than one place. And actually we believe it's both necessary and sufficient. In a prior work, Jing Feng proved actually that if you use the exponential loss, it, it blows up, it doesn't. Sorry? Yes, so the, the, the convergence rate for GD will be, will be this. And, and you can set eta to whatever you want. And so in particular, you can set it to T. But, but you have to know in advance when to stop, so. Okay. Um, okay, I've said most of this. So here's the theorem. Okay, so indeed I, I was a little, I was just remembering wrong. This one is written out with the log one over delta term. And again, there's nothing to be stressed about with this high probability guarantee because the, the idea is when you apply the Martingale, you apply it to this bounded quantity. If you look in a standard SGD proof in a standard textbook, they apply a Martingale not to this object, they apply the Martingale to objects that look more like this. And that's why they hit, get hit with unboundedness. But we apply the Martingale to this. So we first prove an online guarantee and then we apply Martingale to this. It just kicks out another one over T term. That's how we get a one over T rate without strong convexity, of course. No strong convexity. So no strong convexity in this problem. The solution's off at infinity. So the logistic, the second line, the displayed equation. So logistic is just log one plus XP. Yeah. Thing. So that's not bounded. Yeah, so you can do a little bit of uh, careful trickery to, to get that through. But you still apply the Martingale to this, and then you apply algebra to get this bound. I see. Yeah, but the Martingale is always on the bound. No, no, the 18 paper was the first place people did this. Mm. Because moments of this thing is very nasty, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And uh, one thing I want to point out here is that we, we really do pay for the unboundedness of this, though. It's not like we get away for free. So notice that I have this term here. So this is the bounded quantity, and here I get a 1 over t rate. This is the unbounded quantity, and now the rate, the killer term in the rate is the eta over t. So I should have been more clear to you. For instance, you know, you really have to set eta to little o of t. Yeah. But, but this quantity is very nice. The sigmoid, okay, what is the sigmoid? The sigmoid looks like this. In particular, it upper bounds the indicator whether you made a mistake. So the number of mistakes you make is upper bounded by two times this. So you don't need this thing. I think having a zero one loss guarantee is good enough for me. So the zero one loss still goes down by one over t even if the step size goes to infinity. That's what I was saying at the beginning of the talk. Does anyone have any other questions about this? Because this is what I'm going to do on the board. So this is the most important thing to share. And the proof is really easy. It's just the perceptron proof. Oh, I won't do this part. I won't do this blow up. But, sure. but yeah, your point was very good. And, and I think this is the correct answer to your question. Right. I, I think we got stuck in some thing that I We'll tell you later. Oh, yeah, with Daniel. I know about the paper. Yeah, yeah. Again. So that, I think that's exactly where we, if you wanted something very precise and that was. Uh. Okay. Um, so I'll just give you some, some highlights about how the rest of the things go. So the logistic loss, it, it, um, it exponentially flattens. The Hessian goes down just like the loss goes down. It, uh, so 
in fact, you can minimize logistic at this rate if you choose an increasing step size. You can even get a e to the minus t squared rate. In fact, we do not know the lower bound for descent methods. So if you give me a logistic regression problem that's separable, I do not know the lower bound for minimizing with a first order method. It's open. It's, the best I know is e to the minus t squared convergence rate of gradient descent. And you use an increasing step size, but the goal for today's talk is a constant step size. But this actually implies how you get the 1 over t squared analysis. So that's a two-phase analysis. There's an unstable phase, which is controlled by what I just told you about, this perceptron proof. And there's a second part of the proof, which is you enter this highly smooth regime. And that's not really what I'm going to tell you about today, even though it gets this flashy 1 over t squared rate. Just because once you enter that basin, you're in a smooth convex opt problem, which happens to have a smoothness constant of 1 over eta. So that's why the bound comes out. But this is kind of uh, simpler, I would think. Um, yeah, so for GD, you get a bound that looks like this. So once you enter the basin, and here's the entry time to enter the basin. It's this large expression, which maybe I'll explain how it comes from. But the point is the rate you get. And this is the average logistic loss over the training set now. This is batch GD. It's a 1 over T eta uh, rate. So there's this unstable phase. You can only control the average sigmoid. But this is enough to tell you that eventually you enter this basin. You can calculate how long from this bound, how long it takes you to enter the basin. And then you get the 1 over the fast rate inside the basin. Um, oh, there's a question. Yeah. So, like, if you set eta to be like ten to the power ten, like, you will take like a, you'll spend a very long time to get into the second phase. Yeah. What's actually very interesting that we were not able to prove is that it seems like the amount of time it takes to enter the base and pass some step size threshold is actually constant. So it seems like above. Yeah. It seems like for all large step sizes. Just takes constant time to enter the basin. We were not able to prove this. The bound I gave you actually scales with eta, but in practice, and we tried quite hard, and we find this problem quite beautiful. If you saw at the experiments at the beginning, the larger step sizes were actually entering the basin faster. <laughs> Can't prove it yet. Um, I won't go over. These conditions, I'll just say they rule out most losses you would want to ask me about, is one comment. And so one comment is that these conditions, they rule out most losses. And two, if you use like a polynomial loss, so it doesn't go exponentially, but it goes down like 1 over an inverse of some polynomial, then you get these funny rates if you choose eta appropriately. So the 1 over t squared type phenomenon is really with the logistic. And I'm very happy about that because you know, wherever I look, I see the logistic loss. It's how people train LLMs. Like, it's everywhere. So why, why are people using these cross entropy losses? And so every time I see evidence that the cross entropy loss is doing something special, I'm happier. So, so that's why I'm happy about this. Though this is just an upper bound, I should say. We don't have lower bounds for the other losses. And I'll just say, just in order to, for my taste, to emphasize that it is a powerful proof technique, we can handle sort of Shallow, shallow ReLU networks, so still a convex case. I'm, I won't describe this because I want to get to the board work. I just want to say that with a large step size, you get um, a good bound. You just have to blow up. You have to blow up the width of the network with the step size. But this is an NTK analysis. It's not like a feature learning analysis. But the proof technique is powerful enough to handle at least some weak forms of nonlinearity. It's just all I want to emphasize. And. Actually, I won't even, I think I, oh, what? Um, I, actually, I think I should switch to the board. Uh, this, this last thing I want to tell you about, I'll just say that if, yeah, I, I actually, I don't feel like describing it. This I'll put on archive in, in two weeks, so you, you can look then. Um, but, so before I switch to the board, were there any high-level questions? So I'm like clearly too excited to use the board, so all of you are like get, getting my nervous energy. Right. So any high-level question about paper? I, yeah, I should emphasize that my co-authors were excited about this edge of stability connection. 
Mm-hmm. So you're using this martingale argument is that why you can get the large step size? Because if you're using a contraction, you would want a smaller step size, right? Oh, yes. So th- th- this is very, okay, this is very detailed. Because if you look at, it, it is indeed the case that if you look at the, um, if, if you look at a 1 over t rate with, with strong convexity, you have to use this like induction argument, you have to use Friedman, and it's like very painful, right? If you've worked out that proof yourself, like you have to do all this stuff and you get like hundreds, you get like thousands in the constants. We had two, uh, sir, but these were, gen- we had two in our constant, in our bound. Um, no, this martingale is super easy. You calculate, you calculate the variance of, of, of these sigmoids. So we end up with these like quadratic terms and we just drop the negative part. <laughs> it's like a two-liner. I won't do the martingale, but the whole, the martingale is a two-liner. You don't even have to use like a powerful Friedman. You can use one of these like cheap, cheap Friedmans, if you know what I'm talking about. There are these uh, inequalities that are much easier to prove than Huffington's inequality. But basically, the var- for this, the variance is tiny, so. Okay, cool. Oh, turned off the screen. Okay, so what I want to show you, the main thing I want to get to in the time is really just how powerful the perceptron proof is and how it is not exactly the same as the mirror descent people teach you. Okay, so that's my goal. I just want to show you how powerful the perceptron proof technique is. So I'll tell you... I'll tell you a slight variation of the standard mirror descent guarantee. I'll do it only in Euclidean space. Uh, it's like basically the same otherwise, but then the notation is crazy. So then I'll tell you about perceptron, which is mirror descent with the ReLU loss plus um, certain specific choices <laughs> that are very important and interesting. Then. I'll do the same with logistic. And then if there's time, um, I'll at least tell you some parts of the two-phase proof, which allows the arbitrary step size. Okay, so the first thing I want to tell you, which I have to control uh, the tone of my voice when I talk about it, is what I consider the equality version of mirror descent. And I'm only gonna write this in Euclidean case. So suppose I have gradient descent. I'm just gonna write this for my gradient at time i, because beautifully what I write down, it doesn't care what GI is, it doesn't have to be a gradient of anything. So the standard way that you prove what mirror descent does is you pick some arbitrary comparator Z. I'll just call it the comparator. This matters a lot for things like logistic regression where the solution in the separable case is often infinity, so we can't just plug in like the optimum. There is no the optimum. So the standard way of doing a mirror descent guarantee or, or a Euclidean mirror descent or gradient descent guarantee is I expand the square of this that cancels one of the terms. So I get I get my first order term. Sorry, I get my um, convexity term, whatever you want to call it. And then I get this gradient norm term. And I should say that the reason people choose a one over t, root t step size is to eat this term. So in all of the boards, I have to do something to eat this term. That is the gut of the proof. That is the work. Why well, we don't have to use a one over root t step size. Okay, but the way that the mirror descent proof then works is you apply the sum i less than t to both sides, the left-hand side telescopes. And there are a few ways to write what you get at the end 
But the way I like to write it is like this. So I've just put the telescoping on both sides of the equal sign. Here I've pulled out the step size. And then what I get is this inner product term. Oh, there's a two here. Sorry, I keep forgetting the two. I forgot it in here too. And then I get the gradient term. Okay, and I just want to make a very big deal about something. If you open, I'd be surprised if you know of a convex op book that does not drop this term. So of every book I've ever seen in my entire life and every monograph, they take this term, they put on the right-hand side, they say it's a negative, right? They put on the right-hand side, they say it's negative, so we drop it. But this term, it has WT in it. This term prevents WT from being large. Do you follow what I'm saying? This term implies implicit regularization of gradient descent. This term is saying gradient descent does not minimize this objective. It says that minim gradient descent always was trading off between the objective and the norm of the. <laughs> I mean, in every machine learning problem I've ever studied in my entire life, to get a guarantee, we need both the norm to be controlled and the objective to be controlled. This term that's always dropped in every textbook controls the norm. Okay. <laughs> and it was not dropped in the 60s, so I don't understand why it started being dropped. But I'll stop. I'll stop with my uh, rant. So let me tell you about perceptron and how you get perceptron from there. It's like a little bit of a blueprint. So you just make a few choices. So I've told you some of them already. I already told you that GI is uh, this thing. Okay, you already know that, which is the partial of this thing. Okay, so the first thing you do is you choose your reference point to be zero which is optimal, okay? So I'm gonna copy paste this over here and get a guarantee for logistic, and we'll have to figure out what to do instead of zero, because zero is no longer optimal. But if you look at the standard perceptron convergence proof you've seen in every class, they just have a potential which is this quantity because they said z to zero. But it was the same mirror descent all along. Okay, the next funny thing that happens in all the perceptron convergence proofs is how they deal with this term. So they say, well, and you can, you can do this term in many ways. It's up to you how you do this term. One way to do it is you actually just use convexity. So if you use convexity, and I'll just, I'll just start using the notation li, which is lost at time i, which is ReLU of xi, yi, inner product with w. So I get this minus, whoops, just by convexity, I get this minus, this, and for perceptron, you say, well, this is zero, ReLU is zero at zero, and this is non-negative and I'm subtracting it. So for ReLU, the, rel the perceptron convergence theorem, it literally takes the objective function and it throws it away. It says the objective function was not important. So that's one thing that you do, that's one idea. And the other idea is I'm gonna define two quantities. So Mi, which is Gi, and they're gonna be different over here, is the mistake. So it's whether I made a mistake at time i, okay? So I define this quantity, and I use this quantity to massage all of these other terms. I do not use a one over root t or something, I just use uh, algebra now that I've made this definition. So one thing this implies is that eta squared GI squared, this thing is, um, oh, sorry, I see that I, 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 I neglected to say that I have bounded data, sorry about that. And this thing is upper bounded by one, this thing's upper bounded by one, but I'm, so I'm just gonna upper bound this whole thing by, by, by this, okay? That's how you upper bound that term. And then the term on the left, you have 
this thing, you upper bound, or sorry, you lower bound it by this, so you use the variational characterization of the norm or whatever, the duality of norms, and you get this expression. You write out the definition of what this thing is. You get minus sum over time uh, Oh, I forgot to, yeah, let me just say that this is the absolute value of the loss at time i. It's the absolute value because this is actually a negative quantity. So I get uh, actually just some gi, eta i, or just eta, and then u bar, oh, sorry, there's an xy here, xi, yi, u bar, and this is, eta times the sum over time, the mistakes you made, and then a gamma, because all of these are lower bounded by gi times gamma. So the perceptron convergence proof, you take this to upper bound the right-hand side, this to lower bound the left-hand side, and the guarantee you get, I'll just put it in the, in the box here. So again, you, you lower bound this left-hand side using that variational thing, you upper bound the right-hand side using all those other steps I wrote, and you get that the number of mistakes, which I'll write as, by this I mean the sum of them, which is less than this, is less than or equal to one over gamma squared if you just do algebra from there. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, that's something I erased. So u bar was when I had, separa when I had separable data with margin gamma, it's the unit vector that separates the data. So I, yeah, that is the only place in this proof I used the separability assumption, but it's crucial. I don't know how to do that step without separability. Okay. So I, I know I've been going slowly, and for all of you, you're like, wait, I learned this uh, before Andrea's like random matrix theory kindergarten, but um, <laughs> uh, I, if, because I did it slowly, it'll be easy to, to copy paste in logistic. Okay, so now for logistic, so GI is now going to be, oh, so, yeah, I, this is technically an, a negative sign there, sorry. Like chain ruled wrong. Okay, so this is now, okay, let me just define a couple things. So GI is going to be the derivative of the, of the logistic uh, at time i. And so what that thing looks like is it's this negative sigmoid and then I have the x, or I'll actually I'll write it the way I had it, x i y i here. So I'm going to call th this, this quantity now is the absolute value of the derivative of the loss and I'm gonna call this my g i now so it's consistent with the other one. Okay, so the perceptron convergence proof, it controlled the sum of the gradients and here I'm gonna do, do the same thing. Okay, now I just have to go through all those steps and morally I should be able to get the same, the same guarantee. Okay, so the first one is what do you choose for the optimum? And a little bit clairvoyantly, you have to guess that you want a one over t rate and you choose your optimum to be this funky object. Okay, why is this the right object? Because then if I look at the sum of the losses, uh, over time, so if I look at this quantity, okay? So if you just, it, you reverse engineer this by guessing that you want this term to be constant. So you get some less than t of log one plus exp, and because this is, so u bar times this is gamma, that gamma cancels, I just get minus log t. So minus log t, you do the standard approximation, the upper Taylor whatever to log, and this is just one. 
Okay. So that's maybe the only clairvoyant part. The other steps are um, pretty easy. Yeah, actually, I'll go ahead and write out these steps. I think I have time to, to write out the steps. So the next step that we had to do is we had to control this thing. And now I'm actually going to leave this intact. So I'm going to get li z, the loss at time uh, i at time i of, with respect to this reference point. And I know this is 1 over t. So this is less than 1 over t. And then I'm actually going to have, I'm going to leave this term. For perceptron, I left. I killed the term. I said it's non-negative. I don't need it. Here we're going to use it. We're going to use it to eat, to eat the gradient squared. It's going to cancel this. <laughs> Okay. And why am I showing you this algebra? I'm showing this algebra because all of these steps require special properties of the logistic loss, which do not hold for other losses. And you might say they're coincidences, but then I'll say this coincidence is you know, burning half the nuclear power on the planet. So, uh, okay. So in particular, now, so if I define GI is equal to LI prime, then note that this term I couldn't control. So eta squared norm of the gradient squared. So this term by chain rule is gi times xiy, and I still assume x is bounded by 1. So I get eta squared. I use Lipschitz to kill one of them. I just get gi, OK? So far, I've done the same thing I did for perceptron for the right-hand side. But now there's a little bit of a magic trick which is for the logistic loss, you have this inequality. Logistic loss upper bounds is gradient everywhere. You might say this is a coincidence, but uh, I, don't, I don't think so, actually. This property shows up everywhere that the logistic proofs are used. So this term is less than eta squared li w. And this in particular is less than eta liw, where if eta is less than or equal to 1. Okay? So if the step size is 1, I can kill one of these terms. And this term, this term, these two terms will, will cancel. So this term that was 0 in the perceptron will cancel that. It'll eat this term. And the rest of the algebra is the same. Okay? So I won't do the rest of the algebra. But from here, I claim the algebra is essentially identical to this algebra. I've done the interesting part of the algebra. And this is a little bit disorganized. So this number three, like step number three, that's, that's true, but it quickly becomes loose. Is that because you're trying to bound the sigmoid with I'm actually not sure it's loose. It's not loose? Not or, sure. or is it? Because. Sorry. Because this thing is actually on the same order of this, so. Uh, it's loose when you make mistakes. Right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's one of these things like Cauchy-Schwartz. It looks like an inequality, but if you care, is that what you're saying? Like, if you care about the equality case of Cauchy-Schwartz, then Cauchy-Schwartz is not loose. So this miraculously looked loose to me, just like dropping the terms over here is loose, but nobody can prove a better bound. Now, what I meant is something more say is that it's loose on the negative semi-axis. Oh. And Right, you know, so when you oh, make yes. an error, like, so that's a yeah. yeah. okay. mistake, yeah. Thank you. I went philosophical for some reason. <laughs> comment was very technical. Okay. Anyway, so no, you, but, yeah. I claim the rest of the algebra. I mean, this is kind of toxic, but just in the interest of time. So, but what you get is that the number of mistakes at time t, like I said, is bounded above by the, the sum of these gradients. And this thing has a very clean expression, 2 log t over gamma squared plus 2 over gamma. And, OK. And I actually can finish in five minutes without losing anything. So the rest is very simple. Just tell you one trick. So as I mentioned, so phase, phase one is you have to get that the sum of these derivatives is less than or equal to min of 1 over eta 
1 over n. This is quite technical. Oh, sorry, the, the reason why this is sufficient, OK. So I claim phase 1 will achieve this. And phase 2 is now we're in a basin. And so we use smoothness. So the second part of the proof uses the fact that you land in a basin whose smoothness is actually measured by this. And the reason I'm not highlighting this is because, first of all, there's just like the algebra is not as pretty as this, at least to my taste. It's more like a standard convex opt textbook. And I, I don't think anybody would be surprised by, by, by this. Um, this part, oh, and the reason that 1 over n is there is, all right, that's also technical. So I'll, I'll just tell you how we can get into such a good basin, okay, with an arbitrarily large step. So all I'm going to tell you is how to adjust this to use a large step. And um, this was Jingfeng's idea, and it was pretty great for me because I told him about this proof technique, and he instantly saw how to adjust this for the, for the large step. So, uh, I mean, it's both his talent, but also I think it says something about how, how like, cool and flexible this proof technique is. So here in the proof, to kill the squared gradient term, we applied convexity, and then we got a cancellation. But of course, convexity, maybe that's a place where things are loose, perhaps. So Jingfeng's idea was to, to try to get cancellation before you apply convexity. So here's what he did. He said, OK, so we have gi z minus wi plus eta, because there's a common eta term, oh, there's a 2 here, gi squared. And he's going to try to make this cancel before, OK? So the way he does it, he says, OK, I'm going to do the same stuff over here. I'm still going to call this less than equal to eta gi. That's not going to be changed. But here's where he does some magic. He says he's going to call, he's going to break this up into two parts, z1 and z2. So this thing becomes gi inner product of the z1, or let me, let me actually stick to his notation, gi inner product of z1 minus wi. So this term, we're going to use convexity, blah, blah. We're going to get out li of z. We're going to do the old proof here. This proof, we've added in a factor z2 whose single job is to cancel this term before we've applied convexity. And what, what, what do you set it to? Well, I've actually already told you. So GI, so if I just write out the expression, this is minus, this is minus capital GI XIYI. So a natural thing to make this term very negative in order to cancel this thing, because we already have the GI factor, is to make this U bar, which converts this into just gamma. I just realized this is in the way. Uh. <laughs> okay. So we have minus gi xi yi, and the logical thing to do is to set this to something u bar times, I'll just say, some scalar r. And then I get plus eta gi. So this thing is bounded, this is minus gamma gi r plus eta gi, you just have to set r to um, eta over, or there's a 2. You just have to set it to eta over 2 gamma, and you're done. It cancels. And that's it. The rest of the proof goes through. There's some slop, but uh, you get almost the same bound. And so let me just summarize and then conclude, and we stop basically on time. And by the way, like we can put questions to the afternoon or something. Like It's not rude to leave, because uh, lunch is more important. But all I want, the, the, the high level thing I wanted to emphasize is that I feel very strongly that this term that's dropped in all the modern texts is absolutely essential to machine learning. And that's, so that's one part of the message. The other part of the message is there are many ways we can control this term in, in many settings. I've, I've done strange things with regression here too without strong convexity. And um, so that's the other thing I showed you. I, had a bunch of ways to control that term, which were not necessarily. And why does it matter? You know, because in practice, people use atom with small mini batches. And atom is just picking crazy step sizes, right? It, it has a reciprocal. So 
So in practice, people use large step sizes. They see these as a stability. So I think the algebra might be important. And uh, yeah, let me just give a summary and then we're done. So what I told you about are essentially two perceptron results. I told you about the perceptron proof technique. And I showed you that for logistic, it allows you to handle this unstable phase where you end up in this basin. And then you have this smooth phase. And you can interpret the consequences twofold. One is that you can do arbitrary step size SGD. And another consequence is that you can get these fast rates for gradient descent. OK, so I'll stop there.